My name is Deb Nicholson. I am going to talk about software patents. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of an update on what's been going on, some of the recent trends, and then I'm going to get to solutions. So a lot of times when I do the, like, gosh, how horrible is it? People are like, wait, I have an idea. I have an idea. Let's get Superman to patent this and then go back and kick their butts. But hold the awesome ideas till the end because I'm going to go through a lot of the solutions that are already being talked about. So, uh, But if I use a legal term and you're like, I don't know what that is, or I try to scrub all the acronyms out the first time I use things, um, uh, but so if I mention a word and you're like, you guys are like, no idea what that one means, go ahead and ask me those questions as we go along. I don't want folks to be confused while we're going through it. Okay, great. Um, so first we're going to talk about where patents come from. And uh, I'm going to go a little bit back for some context. Uh, and I want us to think about how we measure innovation. So for some folks, that probably depends on who, you know, signs your paycheck. Um, if we measure innovation by the number of patents, we're totally winning because uh, we get about 40,000 software patents each year granted in the U.S. And that's not, uh, there are other patents in other countries. Uh, they just tend to not be so good at it as we are. So um, that's a rise from about 10 years ago, 20,000 patents a year, and then like 10 years before that or so, about 5,000. So that's a curve that looks like this. Um, which uh, means that innovation, if, like I said, if it's the number of patents, we're winning. Um, I do want to decouple two ideas. So a lot of times uh, you'll see, you know, corporate uh, websites for companies that do something software-y and they're like leading in innovation. And uh, in innovation, we want to spur innovation. We want to make sure that we protect innovators and innovations. So. Uh, sometimes we're talking about new actual ideas that can be implemented in the real world and help humanity. And those are great. And sometimes we're talking about monetizing something that someone else is already doing. So when you hear someone say like, but innovation, you know, think of it in the same way that you would hear, but it's for the children. And look at it just a little bit critically and try and figure out like, wait, who's children? So um, just you know, as we go forward there. Um, so I want to also talk a little bit about the difference between patents and products and ideas. So patents were originally conceived to be uh, for physical inventions, which would be more like a product. And that makes it very easy to figure out, like when you've built the exact same thing as your neighbor, you know, because they look the same, they do the same thing, you put stuff in, you get the same result. So the problem of legal notice for when you've infringed on your neighbor's patent is very obvious because you can look at the things and you're like, those are the same things and you built yours a year later. So not so for software. Um, because it's abstract and you can hit the same function with very different code. So someone could write it in Perl, another person could write it in C, someone could write it in Python, another person could write it in Fortran, uh, but hit the same exact function. It might be a little kludgier in one or the other, but um, the patent is on the function and not the actual text of the code. So what happened when we saw that 5,000, 10,000, you know, 40,000 kind of leap in the number of patents that we're granting per year is what we call a rise in functional claiming. So instead of saying, um, I, have, I have an idea for building a thing, and this is how I'm going to build it, and here's a drawing of what I'm going to build, we say, I noticed a problem, and I am going to solve it, and then the implementation is comma on a computer. So those are the patents we're granting. So you can see why that is a problem, right? Okay. Um, so just to, you know, patents, products, ideas, totally separate things. Ideas are, have no implementation. For my own self, like, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I've invented something awesome. It's an anti-gravity bed without an alarm clock. But then I wake up and I don't know how to implement it. So I should not get granted a patent on that. Um, Saying that you've noticed a problem and that you're going to implement it, comma, on a computer is not, it, it, you skip the implementation step. So that's why we've gone from like, huh, patents seem like okay, uh, like they seem to be protecting people and, you know, maybe they're, you know, some are too long or too short or whatever, to like, what? You just noticed a problem and you're going to solve it on a computer. So that's, that's where we've gotten to. 
Um, so I'm sure folks have read a little bit about software patents, like kind of, I assume, because there's probably other exciting talks on this slot that you've, you're at least familiar that there's some stuff here. Um, so the unspoiler alert is that patent suits are costing us a lot of money. Um, the activity, not only the number of patents being granted, but the number of suits being brought, and especially the suits being brought by non-practicing entities, uh, is on the rise. Uh, lawsuits are not spurring innovation, maybe even the monetization, but we'll get back to that, but uh, they're not helping us make new products. And, um, and developers uh, don't enjoy the process. Uh, so uh, just for how much money, Annual wealth loss from uh, non-practicing entities, these are companies that don't make anything, aka software patent trolls, um, loss was $80 billion. They only end up getting about 10% of this money for the, the people who work at the troll company. Um, the $80 billion represents the legal fees, the lost opportunities, the stock prices plummeting, the people at the company spending their time worrying about a software patent suit instead of writing code. So, this, and this is an estimate. There's um, James Besson, who is at uh, Boston University, has a long paper on answering exactly the question, do patents on the software spur innovation? And the answer is, he, I would say, came up with is no. So, uh, but, there, but he did lots of numbers because he's an academic and that's how they say no. So, um, <laughs> so uh, this is the, the suit. So we talked about the number of um, patents being granted. Uh, this is the suits. And again, you see this like terrifying, like off into space kind of curve. Um, and this is, uh, this is from Patent Freedom, which has some other terrifying graphs like that if you want to check those out. Um, the other thing about it being unfun, in specific, and the stuff I'm the most familiar with is, uh, is the Linux system, uh, but, you know, I can't imagine it was fun for kernel developers to go back in and code around the fat patent in the kernel, uh, which was Microsoft's patent that sometimes you use the short file name and other places you use the long file name. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so instead of uh, instead of fighting that, folks went back and rewrote the code in the kernel all the way up to get rid of anything that looked like the fat patent. It's fi fat stands for file allocation table. Um, so uh, I don't think anyone's uh, unconvinced about the unfun, right? People, are, yeah, okay, great. Um, so on the more recent developments, uh, so all of that you probably already sort of marginally knew from reading stuff like Slashdot or Ars Technica. Um, but uh, the more recent developments is that uh, patent aggression entities are getting bigger, the targets are getting smaller, and the types of suits they're bringing are more damaging to innovation. So um, this is uh, Intellectual Ventures. People have probably heard about this. There's a new um, uh, NPR did a follow-up on Intellectual Ventures, which I haven't gotten to look at all of, but um, they have about 1,300 shell companies contained within intellectual ventures. So this leads to behavior where one company contacted this guy in Russia and they did like the nice patent aggression entity where they were like, huh, it seems like you're using our stuff and it would be really nice if you just paid a licensing fee since you know, well, we have the patent on it. And so they sent him a note like that and he was like, it's a US company, it's a ridiculous patent, I'm just gonna ignore it. So then a couple of months later, he gets another note from the, the bad patent aggression entity that was like, we're gonna sue you if you don't stop doing that. And he was like, what, you know? And then got another note from the first one, like, are you sure you don't want a cross license? Which means that they, you know, he would have, um, he would be able to use that patent without being sued on it. So he uh, wrote a, load, a letter to the FBI saying, I think that I have been shook down by a racketeering organization. <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately they're all legally incorporated, so they didn't really fall under the RICO statutes and the FBI wasn't able to do anything for this poor fellow in Russia that was just writing software. Um, but it does lead to uh, some questions about uh, how we apply the RICO statutes, I guess. But uh, 1,300 shell corporations, it's very difficult to figure out um, who you're being sued by, who actually owns the patent, if they're uh, an acting entity or not. And so most people just pay. Uh, they are very good at looking at your company and figuring out like what is the amount 
like when you go to, they know the next thing you're going to do, you're going to call your lawyer, you're going to call like your sister who's an attorney and be like, I just got this letter. And the number that she's going to give you is just over the amount they want from you to settle for how much it would cost to fight it in court. So people settle. All right. So, um, yes. You don't have to answer this now, but the question I'm wondering is why did the patent office allow patents to change from the physical device to the idea? Like what happened historically such that this was this situation, we were able to get in this situation? It's a combination of things. Um, the, the short answer is that the USPTO is um, underfunded and has a short amount of time to look at stuff. Uh, there's also a problem where uh, most of the inventions that they've generally looked at uh, are more traditional engineering things, so you just subscribe to the three or four journals in that area and you know what prior art is and what's novel and non-obvious. Uh, there is no such thing for software. So they don't know where to look, they have almost no time, and there's kind of an incentive to grant patents. Um, so. But I'll get into that a little bit more. That's that's the I could we could go for hours on that. Um, so uh, patent trolls are increasingly targeting users and adopters, not actual like people walking around with a phone. But uh, so like a bank might commission someone to do some database work for them or set up some kind of a website to database thingy or whatever, and uh, they are going after the bank instead of the people who built the software. So the bank knows nothing about the software or what's in there, and so they just pay. Um, and patent trolls, because they don't build anything or sell anything, don't really care if every customer on the face of the earth hates their guts. They don't have any skin in the game in that way. So we're seeing this, it's, it's now about 40% of the time they're going after the user, adopter, or purchaser rather than the maker of the software. Um, and then uh, this is kind of in the device market particularly, suits going deep at the stack level so that you're saying like you just can't have tablets rather than you, you can't have a tablet that does this particular notification when you turn on this thing. So um, this leads to like a very bad kind of lost sales rubric where uh, they're like, oh, your suit is about like the whole idea of the device. So when we grant you lost sales on this patent suit, we'll give you 100% of the cost of the device on one specific thing deep down in the stack. So, um, so that's a problem. So if you were just saying like, oh, this one little thing that actually makes this particular device special, then it's like, okay, so only one company can have that one little feature. Whereas they're saying like, if you're gonna ship any kind of device in this area, like you have to pay us royalties. So that means that we just pay like twice as much for our devices and we don't get as cool of things, which I like cool things, so. All right, so solutions, and there are a lot, and in fact, there was stuff that just was on the news this morning. So we'll get to, we're gonna do um, a little background on what the current statute is, because everyone's like, oh, we should just make math not patentable. The good news is that math is already not patentable. The bad news is, is that that's being enforced in a way that is not particularly helpful for our field. Um, so patentable subject matter already states that stuff has to be new and useful and it cannot be an algorithm. So you're already not supposed to be able to patent an algorithm. Hooray. Uh, unfortunately, if you cover it with a lot of legal verbiage where you're saying using an algorithm on a computer, which is a device, to change or transform or whatever uh, thing from something to something else, then you have at, cr at the crux an algorithm. Uh, being patented because it's on a computer and it's being used. So, um, and that's breaking down, that's breaking down some uh, eye bleeding legal text that uh, you're certainly welcome to look at um, if you're ever feeling like too joyful and happy about the world. Um, so, uh, so already we're, it's, and it's also supposed to be new. You can't just see something and be like, oh, Chris is doing that awesome thing and he never gets around to patenting stuff. I'm just gonna patent it and then I'll go sue him because that'll be funny. You're already not supposed to be able to do that. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, with the problem as far as uh, the Patent and Trade Office understanding what the current state of the art is, um, people get those patents on things that other folks are already doing all the time. Um, and useful. So time travel, like hanging out with magnets, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Um, oh yeah, so we talked about novel, non-obvious, uh, and it's, it's supposed to not, 
uh, be obvious to someone in the field. Has anyone here ever made a basket? Yes. Uh, oh, cool. Um, so if I said to you, like, oh, I'm into this, like, super extreme activity called underwater basket weaving. Like, if you'd never made a basket, you'd be like, wow, she's weird. And, but what it is, is not the person underwater, the basket is underwater, it keeps this strands pliable. So actually the default for basket weaving is underwater. But when you say it like that, to someone who hasn't done it before, they're like, wow, well that sounds like super inventive and new and all that type of stuff. So the same thing is happening with the patents where it's like, yeah, I'm gonna do this uh, windowing display object thing and it's gonna, you know, it'll go up and down like whenever you want. And if you've never seen a computer, you may be like, wow, that sounds great. Um, Xerox Park invented it in 1986. Not really, they patented it in 1986, but, um, Anyway, so it's not supposed to be obvious to someone in that field. It doesn't have to be obvious. Uh, it can still be non-obvious to someone who doesn't know anything about computers. That's totally fine. But it shouldn't be obvious to someone who's already uh, an expert. Um, and then, last, it, like I said, it must be useful and be possible. You can't just say um, something like yarn, you know, harnesses for unicorns. The USPTO will not grant you a patent on harnesses for unicorns. So... Um, which, you know. Uh, so, judicial solutions. Uh, there have been a lot of court cases uh, in this area, and um, the courts have a lot of power to change what's patentable and what's not. Uh, the great thing about the courts is that if they decide that a whole category of things are unpatentable, then it affects patents that are already on the books. Uh, the not so great thing about putting things through the courts is that it's extremely expensive and it's sort of like trying to control an excitable pack of dogs because you have no idea what they're going to do. So you, we could spend a lot of money trying to get some really great specifically targeted cases and try and get them into the right district, which unfortunately is not here in Texas, and uh, you know, see if we could get a case that would allow the courts to shave in precisely the way that we would like them to uh, down the scope of patentability so that it would not include most software patents. Expensive. But uh, so big solutions, big money. Um, so we could try and push the courts to set precedent that better upholds the existing statute. As we saw, the existing statute is pretty good. Uh, it's just not being upheld in a very useful way. Uh, that may be changing. There was a case uh, just this past month, the CLS Bank versus Alice Corporation, and that was a business method patent slash software patent. Um, and they, uh, on appeal, decided that uh, this idea of having two people who have a financial relationship and then having a third party track their transactions between each other, comma, on a computer. <laughs> it seemed, so the USPTO thought that was patentable and then when the two companies fought it out, they decided it wasn't patentable. And then on appeal, the courts actually said, yeah, that's not patentable subject matter. Unfortunately, they didn't really provide any other guidance as far as what now is patentable subject matter and what other things that might belong in that same category are also not patentable subject matter. Courts tend to be very timid in some ways about um, creating precedent. So they'll just be like, it's very tiny, like, well, we only mean for this really specific one. This, is, this one's egregious. And, and so they're very wary of saying, like, and the other 20,000 like that. So, uh, and uh, not to totally be a downer, but we, you, did, you did sign up to come and hear about software patents. It might be overturned on appeal again. So if it goes up to the Supreme Court, they might decide like, well, we are going to go in there and make it worse somehow. So we don't know. Um, but there are other cases floating around uh, that could could help us set that precedent. But like I said, expensive. Um, we could also try lowering the plaintiff's incentive to sue. This is specifically, specifically around the non-practicing entity problem. So um, right now, the way that the lost sales rubric is calculated uh, you know, for devices, it ends up being a much larger percentage of the device than uh, the invention represents. So you might have, uh, I don't know, 5,000 different functionalities contained within a tablet, and uh, one is at issue on a patent suit, and the jury awards 75% of the sales of the device. 
So, um, so we could try pushing the courts to do a better job about this incentivization program. Um, we could also uh, push them to set precedent that treats software patents differently than other patents. And the courts have already done this in the realm of medical stuff because, uh, well, with medical patents, you have sick people who are actually dying on the other side and the courts are not completely immune to what's going on in the world and so they tend to treat the medical patents a little bit differently. Um, I don't know if we can rustle up the sick children and puppies to get them to do the same thing with software, uh, but it would be nice. Um, so, we had to pass a law for the children. Um, legislative solutions. Um, I did talk about how the courts were expensive. Congress, also not cheap. Um, and already owned. And already owned. Yeah, somebody already has those uh, guys. But um, so the, the thing here, uh, again, um, if Congress passed a law narrowing the scope of patentability, it would affect all the existing patents and patents going forward. So, you know, big potential, big money. That's kind of how that goes. Um, we could uh, improve the America Invents Act, which is the uh, piece of legislation we passed a year or two ago. Uh, and uh, some of the things that were in there were pretty good. Uh, we made it illegal to file patents on cheating on your taxes. Um, the government hates when you steal from them. Everyone else is fair game, though. Um, <laughs> we also went from first to file to first to invent, which is it means um, if you invent something but you didn't put it out there in the world or produce any prior art around it and someone else files on it, you get the patent, even if you can show later that you were working on it in your basement alone in secret. Um, that is of dubious usefulness to us, uh, but it does harmonize with the rest of the world. So I guess it makes it less confusing for folks coming from other countries to understand our patent system. To go along with that, they also created more opportunities for people to pri uh, file prior art, do uh, pre and post grant submission process uh, stuff to like get involved in that thing. So it's like, okay, so first to file, but if you are not going to file, but you have information that is germane to a patent application that's pending, we now have avenues at the USPTO for you to come in and do that. And so that's kind of it's kind of mixed. Uh, what they didn't do was increase funding for the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, uh, which would have been really good because then there would have been more time to look at each individual application. So, yes? Who's us? Uh, us. In, you, we, you, you're using a third person? Oh. Um, we, the U.S., I guess. Oh, we, oh I was going to start that. I might have an advocacy group or something. Oh, yeah, I work at the Open Invention Network, but we're not the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. And I say we, like me, in that way, as the community, like, we could submit stuff to the, um, and sometimes OAN does help people with that, so it's kind of a double we there. Sorry. Um, uh, we could get rid of sat, uh, patents altogether. Um, people really like this idea, that's why I said wait, because we'll talk about that. I think, um, you guys familiar with the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, this is not gonna happen. Uh, this would be like, <laughs> This would be like pissing off the Incredible Hulk while you're being swarmed by tigers. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to get rid of patents altogether. We could try getting rid of just software patents, uh, and then we would only have the tigers to contend with. So, um, you know, I, and I think that's not going to happen. Um, when this, we like to think that uh, all of the things that happened in technology have never happened before. But in fact, uh, we, in the U.S., there was already a whole era of patent speculation. Um, farm implements and the railroad industries both had similar problems. And uh, what they ended up doing was an industry-specific solution by coming together and figuring out, like, what should we do about this to change it for our specific industry. They did not get rid of patents altogether. They didn't get rid of all railroad patents. Um, they found a more specific solution. So for the railroads, they worked on creating prior art. They, and they were finally moved by someone who uh, took out patents on brakes on trains. <laughs> and they were like, wait, you don't even have any trains. Also, you can't have a train without brakes. Who is this guy? So then the railroad move, industry was moved to uh, do something about this. Um, we could uh, make the plaintiff pay the legal, field, legal fees, and this is, um, I forget what the backronym is for this piece of legislation, but uh, this is again targeted at non-practicing entities, and um, uh, 
Obama just said this morning, like, he's going to try and push some legislation to uh, try and address the troll problem. I don't think that he's going to address the anti-competitive suit problem um, because those are, well, those are people who buy Congress. And so um, we may see some movement on the troll problem. And, and, and it's sort of another version of this where it allows the courts to uh, punish uh, frivolous lawsuit bringers or trolls. So, so that could happen. It also could have um, it also could have some drawbacks where it ends up being applied in places where it really shouldn't have been applied. So it's it's very it's very dangerous to create another sharp pointy stick in the box for the courts. So, um, and then uh, finally, uh, we could decide to raise patent or maintenance fees. And this again has the problem where it would deter. Uh, software patents from staying on the books for a really, really long time unless the player involved has a lot of money, which is kind of, those are the players that are the problem, so this would also have to be worded pretty carefully. So, um, policy solutions. So, you know, here we are taking time out of hearing something cool that is happening in Perl and hearing about software patents, and you're probably thinking, doesn't the government have people to worry about software patents? And they do. Um, they have the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. Uh, the FTC is actually well aware of the software patent problem. Uh, they've written two 350-page reports, one in 2005 and one last year, uh, that I think no one in Congress has read. Um, they are pretty dense, I do understand. Um, but they are aware that there's a problem. The great thing about a policy solution, particularly at the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, is that uh, it's very doable. Of course, the drawback is that it would only affect patents going forward, so we would still have 20 years of terrible patents to contend with. So this would be a great solution going forward. So probably what we'll end up having to do is some combination of things. But let's look at the policy solutions. Could we make the USPTO enforce the existing statute in a helpful way? Um, I would hope so, uh, but this is a pretty vague um, mission to give them. Like, could you guys just do the thing on the books? And so, uh, which, you know, like your job the way you're supposed to. Um, so uh, one thing, and this is, uh, these are specific legal terms. This one is borrowed from the field of bioinformatics, which has um, problems with, you know, there are people and human genetic material involved. And so um, they have to be very specific when they apply for patents in this field and say exactly how they're going to implement it. And they have to tightly prescribe the scope of their patent so that you're not accidentally patenting people or having a Jurassic Park kind of situation. They want, like, a lot of specificity on these bioinformatics patents. Uh, so they take longer to look at. Uh, but a lot of the extra work is placed on the patent applicant. So, you know, that could happen pretty quickly and it would affect patents going forward. Are we having the actual uh, scope described would uh, rein in a lot of the really rampant, vague patents, and having the actual implementation described would. No, you know, it would take out all of those, like, comma on a computer patents. You would have to really say what you were going to do. So that could be great going forward, not affecting any of the existing patents, though. Um, we could allot more resources specifically for uh, software patents to be looked at at the USPTO. That involves getting more funding for that office. They do this for business method patents. It's a, another pair of eyes, they call it, to make sure that, uh, you know, seven hours into, like, looking at blurry legalese, uh, you send it to someone else in the office and you're like, I think this is novel, but like I haven't been looking at it so long. It's swimming in front of my face. Can you take a look? So that could help us get rid of some of the weird ones. Yes? What if they have like an RFC procedure where other people besides the patent office could look at it? That's the uh, pre-grant and post-grant submission stuff. So that's, uh, and, and patent applications are already public. So we could do that. Um, and and it's, that is one of the things that OIN is looking at, too. So, and I will get to that in the next batch. Yeah, no, I understand. It's, it's good. Um, and uh, right now, we have a situation where the U.S. Patent and Trade Office assumes that a patent is valid until proven otherwise. So for software, that's really pretty dangerous. 
Um, the USPTO also gets, um, uh, so the, they get more money when they grant patents than when they turn them down. So that's also sort of a problem with incentive. Uh, so uh, between the assuming validity and um, more money going to the office for patents being granted, they grant 75% of the patents that they uh, get applications on. Yeah, I know. Um, and then, uh, as I said, the FTC, uh, they've certainly been thinking about it and making graphs and, um, and dry policy papers on this topic for a while. Uh, they uh, were considering or have internally and then uh, written up their consideration of looking at this as an anti-monopoly um, thing or anti-monopoly activity for them. So the FTC is supposed to regulate business and make sure that it runs the way it's supposed to and keep a tight lid on monopolies and make sure that there isn't like corrupt stuff being done under the guise of business and that type of thing. Um, and so a lot of the troll suits or frequent litigator suits uh, could be considered monopolistic behavior by trying to crush their competition out of existence. The uh, FTC said we weren't really sure how we could address that with the current policy tools we have in our box. So we could try and figure out a way to give the FTC some teeth to go after trolls or go after anti-competitive frequent litigators. Um, so community solutions which now we'll talk about that. Um, it isn't, well, actually it's free, um, but it requires some work. So it's free cost, but not free time. So um, as I mentioned, uh, I work at the Open Invention Network. We run a defensive patent pool where everyone signs in and uh, is able to cross license a, a giant swath of open source software patents. Um, no one is allowed to use them for aggression. You cannot go and sue people with them and things like that. You, mm, Question. Yeah. Um, is there a way to apply to sign up for this? Yes, absolutely, and it's free. The basic, like our model is basically like six large companies that we're getting sued all the time. We're like, why don't we all not sue each other? And then as we saw uh, anti-competitive suits and troll suits going after smaller and smaller fish, they were like, oh, so we had the money to put this patent pool together, but what's happening is uh, poor legal precedent is being set by the smaller companies, so then these patents look stronger and more robust by the time we get sued on them. Let's invite the smaller fish into the pool so that they have some teeth if they get sued. And maybe we can co-defend it with them, depending. So uh, yes, any any uh, FOSS project is welcome to join the defense patent pool. Uh, it does mean that you can't sue on the body of stuff in the pool. So if part of your business model is suing other open source companies, then this is not for you. Um, the other thing that we uh, are helping folks to do is, as we were talking about the pre-grant and post-grant submission process, is uh, developing relevant prior art so that some of the patents uh, that are being granted like two years after we invent something in the community aren't being given to trolls. We can get um, prior art to the USPTO so that they know, hey, this isn't new. I have a thing on it already. This is not new, and I can't grant you this patent. So. As I said, the problem where uh, with physical inventions, they had all these journals they would subscribe to and they would just know like what's going on in their field. But for folks who are looking at software patents, they're not, uh, they're not crawling around on our Git repositories checking to see if that particular piece of code you wrote last night is relevant to the patent that they might grant tomorrow. Um, so we need to really kind of spoon feed it to them and not expect them to uh, do that. Um, so uh, another project, uh, this one I'm not connected with, uh, Jennifer Urban, she's an academic. She thought, hey, so people really like the GPL and that seemed to really work. Like maybe we could do some kind of a copy left for patents. And so she's, uh, and this is still in beta and t still taking comments, has written something called the Defensive Patent License, which is similar to the Defensive Patent Pool, but is uh, just for anything, any kind of software. It's not specific to open source or Linux or anything like that. And so, um, there, and there's two versions of this. One where you can put your patents in the pool, like under the defensive patent license for a little while with the uh, ability to pull them back out later, which could be really problematic if someone else was depending on that being in the pool. Um, and then the other one, which is called the hard DPL, where you put it in the pool and it has to stay in the pool forever. 
like the GPL. So, um, like I said, that's still in beta. You can't sign up for that yet, but if you had ideas or, or wanted to contribute or thought you uh, know how to make that better, then that's still in beta. And then lastly, I think this is very important, and there is a, another great piece from This American Life following up on the patent troll problem, but uh, continuing to build awareness and draw attention to the problem. I don't know how many of you go visit your legislator or call your legislator at least once a year? Yeah? Okay. Um, so put this on the list of things you mentioned to uh, her or him when you visit or call. Um, hey, software patents. I know, you know, it's, I think a lot of the public sees uh, Apple and Samsung, like two very large companies, or like Microsoft and anyone, and they're like, those are dudes with like 50 houses, like duking it out and maybe losing one house worth of money a piece. Like the amount of sympathy the public has for that is like very, very tiny. So uh, I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that the other part people are hearing is that this is creating real problems for smaller companies, for people you know, people that don't have 50 houses. And um, you know some of the things that we're doing here in the free software community are saving lives, helping people, empowering people, and that it's, it's not just two dudes selling a lot of devices at like 300 times what they pay for them. Yes? Did anybody come up with a number for the increased cost of a device like an iPhone because of patent problems? Someone may have. Um, I did not look at that. I'm not a. I, I haven't looked at that much of the Apple data well, to be. Apple, oh, yeah. How many people have iPhones? It's a rhetorical tool. It's basically, that cost you $50 because. You right. Yeah, I think uh, someone floated that it might be like twice as expensive as it needs to be because of the cross license, but it, there's so many different phones on the market that it probably depends on each one. But, um, and that's. It's a rule of thumb sort of thing just to make it clear that it does affect. Yeah, that would be great. If I find that piece of data, I'd be happy to share it. Because um, I, I, I think it is very nice when you talk to people to have something very concrete. Um, and especially when you, someone's just bought their phone and they're like, you mean $100 of that went to a patent attorney? <sighs> Make it personal. I, uh, yeah, so uh, if you want to read more about this, uh, Colleen Chen, she goes into depth on the patent speculation with the railroad industry and the farming industry to sort of uh, provide some blueprints on what we might do as a community around software patents. Um, and she writes in a very good, like, uh, voice for the layperson. It's not, like, overly, like, you know, irritating to read. Uh, this is the one uh, all about the patent trolls. Uh, it's got a great story in there about how Nathan Mervold accidentally sued himself, we think. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, <laughs> he dropped himself from the suit. Um, <laughs> and then uh, this one is uh, talks about the legal precedences and uh, fun focuses a lot on the functional claiming problem that I talked about where we're patenting the solution and not the actual implementation uh, to f to come up with a solution. I mean, the, you know, so the problem of uh, saying I'll solve the problem as opposed to how you'll do it. And uh, those are all picture credits, and I am happy to take questions. All right, right here. How long does the patent last for? Uh, 20 years. That is one thing that is being floated as a policy change is that, uh, and that goes with like how pharmaceutical patents are, and they're like, well, we could use 25, but for us, like, you know, in, in software, me, like three would make them not super egregious in a lot of cases. No open source, six weeks would be good. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Right, and that's why I said that I think the best policy solutions are going to be ones that uh, focus specifically on the field of software and don't try to do some kind of sweeping reform on all patents. Yes? So going back to the how long does a patent last thing, I yeah. looked up on the internet judging by how long Mickey Mouse has been copyrighted figuring, oh, well, patents are probably the same thing, and here I find a page with on the USPTO about renewing you know, a patent. So how frequently does that happen for software? You can renew a patent. Um, it's it becomes more and more expensive over time, and then uh, and then patent law and copyright law, of course, are separate. Um, 
but yeah, those are like what they call maintenance fees, but you have to do another process to renew them and it's expensive. Um, and so you can, but there are so many patents that are vague and broadly written enough that are a little more current. Usually they don't. Is it expensive though for you and me or is it expensive for Apple? Oh, is yeah. Um, yeah, if you're making $9 billion a year, and that was the number from the, like, a little less than 10% of the 80 billion that's going on the floor, um, then no, it's not expensive for them. If that if they find a patent that is like a license to print money, basically, because everyone's using it and everyone settles, they'll pay to renew it. I figured. Yeah. Is there a maximum, can they, is there a maximum lifetime for a patent? I think that uh, you have to, because you have to talk to the USPTO each time you renew it, um, it's, they tend to not go over and over and over again, but... Is there any way to find out what patents have expired and build software based on expired patents? Oh, interesting. Um, you could. Um, I mean, the so I say that in a little bit dubious because the USPTO website, uh, like, granted patents is excruciating to search through. Um, it um, it seems, I think they might be using dial-up, like circa war games. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, so for anything that you search, like any area that you would search on, and it's all like, it's all undifferentiated, like all, um, all implementation type patents that are not design patents are all in the same pile. Uh, you put in your search terms, they're all named vaguely, and then you get search results like 10 at a time on the page. Um, so you could. Um, I, I I don't know if that would be a super great use of your time. You should figure out a way to do it patent to method. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. So, um, yes? So uh, in, in some of the corporate environments that you work in, a lot of times you get pressure to file software patents sure. and things like that. And one of their main arguments is that they need them to defend themselves against other companies when companies come in to do drop swaps and mm -hmm. So the... Um, the defensive publication. Mm -hmm. So is that meant to kind of help the kind of? Right. So it's like you. It's it's similar, but not precisely legally the same as as public domain. So you're saying, I am giving you like all of the documentation that I I created this thing, but I don't want a patent on it. I just want you to not issue other patents on it. Okay. So you can't use those to counter sue, but you could use them in case to overturn a patent. So. The, like it's a bit more expensive. So if you if you get the, the letter, um, and then your company uh, they can send back an immediate countersuit if they have other patents. Right. Um, but you can't countersue with a defensive publication. So that's the. The question there, I guess, is what, what argument do we have against these things? You, when, to go back to the well, why should I do this? You know, can't we use something else? Is there no other really viable option for anyone really? I guess is, is the, to to defend yourself against. Oh right! Is it is the only way to, to file patents? Is is to file other patents? Is that we have to file the patents because we have to have protection. Right. Um, I think the defensive publications could work if your company is willing to fight to overturn it. Um, but in the current environment, uh, I I do understand why companies would say like we need patents for defense. But they could patent them if they're willing to pay the money anyway, and then add them to the defensive pool. Right? Yes. You can definitely add them to the defensive pool, which is, that is a great way for your company to have the patents, but also show goodwill towards the rest of the FOSS community. That's one of the things, it's not, it's not, it's not open source at all, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I don't know where you work, so. <laughs> Maybe the defensive patent license is something you guys want to look at as that gets. Equivalent of that, but defensive pool, but not for open source necessarily. Yeah, they tend to not have the non-aggression clause. You might have heard of MPEG LA. Yeah, so, okay. Um, anyone else or for questions? Yes. I know in the mechanical patent, you have to actually describe the device in detail. Yeah. In the software patent, do you have to release source code? No, because the patent is on the function and not the code. So copyright law covers the written word, the code. Um, patent law covers the function. So people do not include source code on that. Sometimes they'll include the algorithm, but they don't include the source code. But they're not required even to specify the algorithm in detail. No, you can uh, not for most things. Uh, it's 
you might have more stringentness in the, like I said, medical or bioinformatics, but for software you can just say that you're going to do something really cool. And then cover it with a lot of, yes, on a computer. Which is where all the cool stuff happens, right? Anybody got the patent for doing something really cool, comma, on a computer? There are probably some that are worded almost that badly, but... Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, any other any other questions? Um, yes. Quick hands up poll. Who here has actually participated in like a lawsuit or was asked to testify, you know, for? Mm. No. <laughs> yep. You mean for software? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, nothing personal. You don't have to, you don't have to fess up to that stuff. Part of your company duties, yes. Um, did you want to comment on that? Or I know most of the times uh, once a lawsuit has happened, so one of the things we never get to talk about at OIN is lawsuits that we've helped with that settled out of court because usually part of that um, settlement is that we will never speak of it again. So... Is that the case with you also, or did no, you want to add anything else? The company I worked for was sued on a patent. Uh -huh. um, and I was asked to testify on a product, you know, that I really never touched. And, you know. Yeah. So it was just, it was a super, super hassle for no good reason. You know. Yeah, so and then you're not on the legal team, you're a developer, I'm, I'm guessing, and so, uh, yeah, so that's part of that 80 billion dropped on the floor from troll suits is that, um, you know, it's your time could certainly have been better spent, so, yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, if people want to ask me, like, what? Anything generic that can be... Um, discern from your experience of uh, all these uh, suits that have been subject to gag orders that you can share. Um, the, well, the good news is, is that when you push back on the troll suits, you tend to win, but it's very expensive. Um, and on the and the same is true to a lesser degree, but pretty similar on the anti-competitive suits. You don't always win those, but um, when you do, it still is expensive, even to settle out of court. I guess I would make one comment on that. Um, the reason the trolls are going after the smaller fish is because the big fish can stop them now. Right. Yeah. And they're going to go after you know a guy who's got a patent pretty soon, not just. Companies that are using them. Yeah, and so for OIN, anyone at any size is like, we have individuals that are in the defensive patent pool. We have companies that are like two guys in the basement um, or two gals in the basement. Uh, we have, and then all the way up to like IBM, Red Hat, and Novell. So um, it's available at any level. And you had one back here. Yes. There's been like sites like LegalZoom and things that come out. How effective is a token legal gesture at combating a troll suit? Um, I don't know about the legal zoom thing. Like the smallest amount of money possible to just counter so you make the troll think that you might actually have. Like, oh, it probably depends on the troll. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like, so uh, people probably recently read the Red Hat Rack Space uh, where they went against Unilock and overturned those patents. Um, you know, so that was, uh, I mean, like the thing about. Uh, I think the part that is getting confused there is you can't counter sue a troll because they don't make anything. So, so I mean, when they, when they call you and say we're suing you or whatever. Oh. Then, you know, they go, like, oh, here's my attorney or whatever. And then do they just, I mean, is there, some of them will buzz off at that point because they think it's going to actually go to litigation? Oh, um, there's probably a couple letters involved, but yeah, some, you, you can, I think, um, they, uh, I mean, for them, it's a numbers game. They know that they're going to, um, they're probably only going to win, like, 40% of the letters they send. And so they just keep sending them. Um, I don't know, like, I think you have to show that you are serious about uh, fighting the suit before they will buzz off. Um, because it's just, it, for them, it's just numbers. And they have a little bit of uh, investment in that patent because if it, 
um, if it isn't overturned, then they can go and sue other companies with it because now it's been like stamped as uh, awesome, strong, robust, real patent. So they will. They usually will continue to fight. They don't settle when you uh, send them back a thing saying that we're gonna try and overturn that patent. They are like, well, yep, we figured uh, we have budgeted for some certain amount of that. Is that's my general gloss, um, and from what I've seen, no one. Um, sadly, I cannot tell an anecdote about someone who sent a really awesome, sternly worded letter to a troll and then was left alone. <laughs> Anything else? Oh. Which uh, state legislatures, if you happen to know, are most receptive to software packages? Reform? Reform, yeah. yeah. So most of the legislative solutions I, were talk I was talking about was at the um, uh, national level, but I think it's the state legislature, might be Vermont, might be New Hampshire, I always get them confused, um, despite them being our little neighbors to the north, um, just tried to pass a statewide law trying to um, illegalize software patents in their state. So, um, of, uh, as to how impactful that will be, we won't know. And it like a Vermont thing. yeah, I think it might have been Vermont. And there, yeah, they're Bernie Sanders up there with a lot of you know. They also have non pollution. <laughs> right. Um, so, so, so Texas is still the worst. Uh, you know. Yeah, although the CLS Bank versus Alice case that I mentioned, the circuit court that said, like, yeah, you're right, that is non-patentable subject matter was here. So, um, so some like there is a there is a line that is too egregious for them to cross, which is nice because it didn't seem like there was one before. <laughs> Right, so uh, so OAN uh, will help anyone who wants to do a prior art hackathon. Um, I would say that uh, the like EFF has um, also like some action alerts as far as looking at the legislative side of things and uh, following some of the cases. Although they're sort of crowdsourcing the solutions on their site, so some of them are. Well, you know how crowdsourcing goes. Some are good, some are less good. Um, but the but what their attorneys are doing there as far as, far as filing front of the court briefs is awesome. So I would sign up. Um, uh, let me know if you want to do prior art hackathons and um, and then sign up for the EFF's uh, action alerts in that area. So the U.S. government's been trying to push more data out, uh, make government data available. Is the patent database one of those things that's being uh, oh, I don't know about that. Um, so the, in theory, the patent database is already available online in that extremely slow, like 10 patents at a time way that I mentioned. So I don't know if there are, is any kind of movement to, I don't know, put a modern database on the back end of that thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I, uh, I'm gonna shut down and you can accost me in the hallway if you still have questions. Thank you.